Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you from my office area, my craft area, because we are going to be doing the five star audit. This is a video that I've seen several booktubers do. Most recently, Kayla from Books and La La did it. And so basically what I am going to do is look back at years past and look at books that I have rated five stars just to kind of see what books I actually award that to. There is a stats page that's pretty interesting that I knew literally nothing about uh, before I think Riley Marie had done her five-star audit. There is a stats page on Goodreads that essentially will show you your yearly stats for every year you have been on Goodreads and it does it by rating. Here's a look at the past few years on Goodreads. Uh, definitely more in 2021 than anything else just because I read more that year than I think I ever have. One thing that I really like about these videos is how many booktubers have themes in mind and they have keywords in mind, uh, kind of key tropes that they think they generally award five stars. And I tried to do some thinking before going into this, and there are things that I know I'm interested in and things that nearly always pique my interest. I'm always going to pick up a book that has X in it, but I don't know if in reality, I often award those books five stars. Just kind of a disclaimer too, before we get into this, is just how I rate books. It has changed remarkably for me since coming onto BookTube. And so I would say, I don't think we can trust my rating on anything past maybe five years ago. 2016 is when I studied abroad. And so part of me feels very attached to those reads, but I got onto BookTube in 2018. And I really feel like since getting onto BookTube, how I rate has changed and what I am looking for in a good book has changed. One thing I do know about me when I rate something five stars, I don't necessarily think I'm stingy with it, but I don't think I give as many five stars as some other booktubers do. It takes a lot for me to give a book five stars. And I have really two categories of five stars. One is just kind of based on merit. I think the book deserved five stars. And that's nearly always going to be the classics that I think show up here. I often rate classics if I really enjoyed them five stars because technically I admire them. But there is a second category of five stars that is essentially based on emotion for me. I was emotionally invested. I was really engaged in it. And these are often books that I can recognize I might want more from in a prose sense. Or maybe I have some issues with the plot. I can recognize that there were plot holes in it, things like that, but I don't care because of my emotional investment in the story. And those to me are the more valid five stars and they are the more important five stars. And moving forward, that is really what I want to do. I only want to be giving five stars to books that get the emotional reaction out of me. And I think that's hard as someone who reads classics because I think we often think objectively a book that has stood the test of time, must be great, must deserve five stars. It's not true. Pulling this up, uh, you can see that I have basically the past 10 years because I got onto Goodreads in 2012. I would say we can't look any further back than maybe 2017. Uh, 2018 is when I got onto BookTube. My fifth year anniversary is about to come up, which is crazy. And so I would say let's maybe go back that far. What's interesting is that this year so far, I already have two five stars and they are definitely the emotional ones for me. And so I wanna talk about trends that I think I notice in my own reading. And so I'll be interested to see if it is true. I noticed that Kayla from Books and La La had maybe 10 categories. I couldn't come up with that many. I think essentially one of my big categories is going to be Old Norse Viking inspired. I might even extrapolate that more broadly and say something medieval, but there is something very specific to Old Norse Viking stuff that I think I tend to click with. And so I don't notice anything from last year, but definitely in 2021, I started my year off with uh, Hall of Smoke by H.M. Long, which is a Viking fantasy. The first book that I read in 2021 was actually The Witch's Heart by Genevieve Gornishek. So that is really a Norse myth retelling. 
And going even further back than that, I know we're not supposed to trust things from 2016, but The Last Kingdom by Bernard Cornwell, easily one of my favorite books of all time, definitely my favorite historical fiction series. And so I think this is something that shows up for me time and again. I want to also say maybe not just Viking set, but maybe just in general kind of early medieval time periods. Daughter of the Forest, Half Sick of Shadows by Laura Sebastian. Those kind of tap into this kind of dark age mythological setting that is not quite historical, but not quite fantasy. And there's just something about stories set during this time period that feel very mythical to me. I think there is also generally a very melancholy theme to stories like this. And I think what's interesting is that this stands true for me not only in historical fiction, which is where I expected to see it the most, but in Norse myth retellings and also in fantasy. And I am very hard on Viking fantasy, so I am shocked to see that something like Hall of Smoke got five stars from me. But this isn't always true because Sister Song, which I would say kind of goes along with this, is one of my worst books of the year in 2021. So I feel like with Vikings Old Norse stuff, it's got to be either five stars or one star, and it feels like there's just no in between for me. Kind of going hand in hand with that, I think I'm just someone who really is into Italy. And I don't wanna just say Italian literature or stuff that's been translated from Italian, but I enjoy things that are set there. I enjoy fantasy that is in kind of uh, an Italianate world. I just am really attracted to Italy. And it's not even a specific time period of Italy. I wondered if it was something like maybe Renaissance, but I am really into Italy from all aspects, whether that is ancient Rome, whether that is more modern Italy. I am just really fascinated by it. And that shows up time and again for me. One of my favorite books from 2021 was A Brightness Long Ago by Guy Gabriel Kay. That is fantasy set in a world that mimics Italy. And it was amazing, beautiful, stunning, incredible. Uh, and I also have several historical fiction things on here by Sarah Denant, The Birth of Venus, one of my all-time favorites. Her Borgia book is one of my all-time favorites. I almost could have made the Borgias a category, but I think, again, the Borgias are very Marmite for me. I will either give a book about the Borgias five stars or I will give it one. We have stuff like The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. So that is a classic that is set in Italy. So this doesn't really feel tied to a specific time period at all. It just feels like I'm really attracted to Italy. And that's definitely true because also turning up on here are just in general Italian classics. Dante's Divine Comedy, A Room with a View. Really the majority of what I have named has nothing in common except for Italy. So I think that's really interesting and I picked that up. I thought for sure that would be a theme and I'm really, really glad to see that for the most part it is. Something else that I tend to really enjoy is Dark Academia. And I think I mean specifically dark academia, and I don't mean anything that is set at a school. I think a lot of people really favor school settings, and that's not really true for me. And I think it's why I resisted dark academia for so long, because I just didn't really want to go back to a school setting in a book. But dark academia really hits a lot of marks for me personally, because I've worked in academia. And I'm not particularly partial to one type of dark academia. I really love dark academia that is set in the past. I love dark academia that is fantasy, like A Lesson in Vengeance by Victoria Lee. I love, love, love dark academia that is crime set, like The Likeness by Tana French, or If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio. I love The Secret History by Donna Tartt. These are all books that I have rated five stars in the past five years. And many of the classics that I have rated five stars over the past few years, I think also scratch the same itch as Dark Academia in terms of being thematically about knowledge and maybe the exclusivity of knowledge in particular. I think a lot of the classics that I have been really drawn to also deal with themes that are present in Dark Academia. And so I think Dark Academia is definitely something that I often give five stars. There's not many things that I see here, especially in the past few years, that I would label Dark Academia that I have rated less than four stars. So I think it's definitely something that I really like. And apparently it is something that I often award five stars to. 
I feel like underlying the majority of the books that I give five stars is just in general beautiful prose. I wanted to make that a category, but then I wondered, is that just in general what I often give five stars to? Do all of these books in all of these different categories have this beautiful language? And that's not really true. Thinking back to my initial two ways of rating, the books that kind of get an emotional pull out of me, the ones that I rate five stars because I was so invested in the characters, I was so invested in the relationships between the characters, they often don't have the best prose in my opinion. And I don't wanna say it's bad writing because it's not. A lot of people and a lot of readers prefer a pared down prose to something like purple prose. Whereas me, I love that. Please be pretentious. Just talk pretentious to me. I really love purple prose. And I find that I will often rate a book higher based on that alone. Uh, even if I'm not necessarily enjoying it, a book that has great prose is going to get a higher rating from me than a book that I really loved that I just think could have been better written in terms of prose. So I think this is a category in and of itself. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne once again falls right in under this. Uh, one of my favorites from last year, A Certain Hunger definitely has to go here. Demian by Herman Hesse, which is now one of my favorites of all time. Interview with the Vampire, which is my favorite book of all time. I feel like most of the books that I rate five stars don't tend to have a lot in common. And I feel like those that I just listed have absolutely nothing in common except for beautiful language. And this is hard. That's a hard one to look at your TBR and say, what is something on my TBR that has beautiful prose that I'm gonna want to pick up soon? Because that's often not how a book is sold. A book is not often sold as being beautifully written. And so I feel like I go to classics for that, to scratch that itch. And now I would say I also go to literary fiction, though I am currently reading a book that's going to get five stars from me for the writing alone. And it's Roshani Chalkshi's new novel, Last Tale of the Flower Bride. It's going to get five stars for me from the writing alone. It's gorgeous. We have things like Booth. We have Dr. Faustus by Thomas Mann. Uh, so many books I have rated five stars. I've rated five stars basically because of the writing. And what's weird though is I would say that those books don't tend to be ones that I ruminate on very long. This is another question to have when thinking about what you rate five stars, because clearly most of what I rate five stars does not enter the echelons of a favorite book of all time. So what really clarifies that for me is if I think about the book for a long period of time. And weirdly, I would say most of the ones that I have rated five stars for the beautiful prose are not ones that have stuck with me. I feel like I need something more. I need something thematic. It's really in the end, those kind of emotional gut punch books that stick with you for a long time. Fireborn by Rosaria Munda. The Winner's Curse by Marie Rutkowski. These are books that have stuck with me for years and years because of the character work has nothing to do with the writing. And so I would say maybe I also wanna put in here great character work. I feel like that's so basic. So I'm trying to think of what really attracts me to a book in terms of character work. And it's definitely got to be romance. It's got to be angst specifically. But I feel like I'm really attracted to that in a fantasy setting. So things like The Infernal Devices by Cassandra Clare, things like Caraval by Stephanie Garber, Once Upon a Broken Heart, those all hit that for me. And again, that's hard for me to predict when looking at my shelf. I don't think anything automatically jumps off to me as something that's going to scratch the same itch as something like Fireborn. Though I don't think I can call that a category, but I feel like I wanna say angst in relationships is what ties all of those together. That's what I want out of romance. I don't want you to get together right off the bat. For me, it's the chase. I'm a Sagittarius, okay? So for me, it is the chase. Once you get together, it's over for me. It's done. And so I think I really want from a book that is featuring a prominent romance, I want it to give me a slow burn and I want it to give me a good reason that these characters can't be together. And those three had that and had that in spades and it happened in such a way that it aided the character development. And so I think that's really what I'm interested in is angst, but also slow burn. 
something else that really sticks out to me from this is just in general a retelling. I wanted to call it a fairy tale retelling, but I don't think I can because my top book of the year this year is The Villa, which is a retelling of Mary Shelley's life. It is something that I really enjoy and I never really complain about it, if that makes sense. I'm never really unhappy with the choices made in terms of retellings because to me that's exciting. It's exciting to me to see how an author is going to tackle a new topic. And so this isn't necessarily just fairy tale retellings, though I really love those. This directly goes into my next theme, and maybe I should just combine these, but that's Death and the Maiden. I was going to call this Hades and Persephone, but Death and the Maiden, I think, is more broadly applicable because something that I'm really into is like a death god. And so we have Belladonna from last year. Belladonna by Adeline Grace, one of my tops of the year, Death and the Maiden story. Of course, of course, A Court of Mist and Fury. One of my favorites of all time is a Hades and Persephone retelling. Deathless by Catherine M. Valente, another of my all-time favorites, and is also a Death in the Maiden type story. Hunted by Megan Spooner, also Death in the Maiden, but also kind of Beauty and the Beast. I feel like Death in the Maiden and Beauty and the Beast are very comparable story tropes, but they're a little bit different. And I am specifically interested in something that's featuring like a death god or death himself. I really, really love that. And maybe it's not just death, but it is something that embodies death, maybe more mortal. I would say immortals are definitely a category, uh, and they can be a separate category from this. But I am definitely very interested in immortals in stories. And it's not just, oh, this is about a vampire. I need a vampire who's grappling with that, okay? Who's grappling with the fact that they are so old. Interview with the Vampire, I don't even need to point it out. My favorite of all time. We then have last year, Barney the Vampire. Incredible, I know those are both vampire stories, but they really meditated on immortality and what makes that terrible, but also what makes it great. And I am more interested in it being terrible. I'm more interested in an introspective discussion of that than I am in just it being a fun romp with a vampire, if that makes sense. Addie LaRue also goes for this, in my opinion. My last category is something I'm just going to call historical fantasy because I feel like I can put Guy Gabriel K under this. Even though his books are set in a fantasy world, they are meant to clearly evoke a specific time and place in history in our world. But I also wanted to talk about the Diviners. I feel like there are many that I'm forgetting, and maybe I would even say kind of a historical figures retelling in a fantasy world, like Iron Widow, which is a retelling of China's first female emperor. I feel like all of those stories work well for me. Even when I don't rate it five stars, I feel like a historical fantasy is generally a fun time for me. Of these categories, the one I would say that I have given the most five stars to is actually Dark Academia. I think objectively in the last five years, I have given 10 Dark Academia books five stars. Next, I would say it's Italy. If I'm just going on a broad category, I feel like that's cheating a little bit, but then I would say it's Italy. So I think that's interesting because had you asked me a couple of years ago if I was particularly interested in Dark Academia, I would have said no. I don't think I would have been very interested in it. And yet looking at the stats, that is something that shows up for me time and again. So that was my five-star audit. I hope that y'all enjoyed it. I have really enjoyed watching everyone do these videos. Um, I would love to know what your own five-star audit is. What are your categories? What things do you typically give five stars to? But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.